This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, so that we may truly love you and worthily praise your holy name through our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And I would now like to invite uh, Leone to bring us the Gloria and our confession. Leone. Glory to God in the highest and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, God heavenly, heavenly King, King, Almighty God, God and Father. Father. We, we worship, worship you, we, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Hear the teaching of Christ. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Spirit of God, search our hearts. Hear God's word to all who turn to Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And Jesus said, Come to me, all who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God has promised forgiveness to all who truly repent, turn to Christ in faith, and are themselves forgiving. In silence, we call to mind our sins. Let us confess our sins. Merciful God, we have sinned in what we have thought and said, in the wrong we have done, and in the good we have not done. We, we have, have sinned, sinned in ignorance, we have, have sinned in weakness, we have sinned through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry. We, we repent and turn to you. Forgive us for our Saviour Christ's sake, and renew our lives to the glory of your name. Amen. Through the cross of Christ, God have mercy on you, pardon you and set you free. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. God strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in life eternal. Amen. And our sentence for this week is taken from the Gospel of Mark. Those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for the sake of the gospel will save it. Let us pray. Almighty God, you are Alpha and Omega, beginning and end, the word made flesh. Grant us the courage to take up our cross and bear it gladly for the sake of the gospel, risking mockery and rejection following the example of Jesus. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I'd now like to invite uh, Wayne and Susan Paul to bring us our first reading and our gospel. Wayne and Susan, thank you. Okay, a reading from James chapter 3, beginning at the first verse. 
Not many of you should presume to be teachers because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is perfect, able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. We'll take ships for an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by people. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse others who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praising and cursing. This should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? Can a fig tree bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, chapter 8, beginning at verse 27. Praise and glory to God. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say Elijah, some say John the Baptist, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Christ. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days, rise again. He spoke plainly about this. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it? for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to Christ, Christ the word. Thank you so much, Wayne and Susan. People are fascinating. We're all so unique and different. We're not mind readers. We can't 
tell everything about one another. And yet we spend our lives in one way or another getting to know and understand people, making friendships, building work relationships, getting to know our neighbors, spouses, learning more about the person they've sought to make a life with. We spend our lives getting to know others, and yet people are still able to surprise us. No matter how well we know someone, we often find that there are things we just never realized. And I think that's a wonderful part of our humanity, that our relationships, friendships, and interactions with others are full of the unexpected, the interesting, and the new. It's a minefield for curiosity. Of course, one of the flip sides of this is that in trying to understand someone, there are times that we get it spectacularly wrong. It might not have been our fault, but we have perhaps jumped too far ahead. We have labeled them in ways that made sense to us. We have understood them according to our own experiences. Unfortunately, that can leave us wide of the mark at times. We've freighted all of us onto them. Now, we have all probably, possibly encountered an experience of being stereotyped at some point in our lives. It could have been something very minor or something very major, but someone's tried to understand us by putting us into a box of their own making. And this can be misleading, constricting, and for us, even downright hurtful. Well, in today's gospel reading, we hear of an interesting conversation between Jesus and the disciples. He's been with them for a while now. They know him. And we see Jesus asking them about his own identity. Who do people think that he is? And the answers pour out. The crowd, the people, the everyday uh, villagers think that he might be John the Baptist or Elijah or one of the great prophets come back to life. But then Jesus makes the question a little more pointed. Random strangers might think that, but what about his immediate disciples who he's traveled with and taught with and lived with? Who do you say that I am? And Peter answers him with an amazing and a straightforward confession of faith. It seems you are the Messiah. There we have it. Peter recognizes Jesus as God's anointed one. So it's surprising then, or it could be surprising, that straight away, Jesus orders the disciples not to tell anyone about himself, not to tell anyone this. And further on in the passage, Jesus even rebukes Peter. Why would he do that? You'd think that Peter was right in recognizing Jesus as the Messiah. So why keep it a secret? And the answer perhaps lies in Jesus' own opinion that Peter's set his mind not on divine things, but on human things. Peter's got the name and the title right fine. You and I equally might be quite comfortable in the names that we might use to speak of Jesus, whatever they might be. Christ, Messiah, Lord, Savior, Master, Friend, Teacher, Prophet, Son of God, Liberator, Redeemer, what you will. But for Peter, what does Peter think the title he's just used means? Well, Peter views that word Messiah in a very human way, a very worldly way. He ignores what Jesus is saying about what the Messiah will go through, what it means. In fact, Peter gets angry that Jesus would dare define it that way. Because from Peter's point of view, the Messiah is a triumphal figure, someone who conquers Despite Jesus being quite open and explaining that 
The son of man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and even be killed. To Peter, that's a scandal that he can't wrap his head around. One wonders if he's even heard the last word, that after three days, the Messiah will rise again. And so no wonder Jesus has to tell them to keep quiet and not tell anyone about himself. Because what they'd be telling wouldn't be right. It would be their own sanitized interpretation. They've stuffed Jesus into a box. And what they'd be talking about were all the bombastic heroics and none of the pain or difficulty. But the truth is that the Jesus we meet and the Messiah that we follow and the God we worship, that person did undergo great suffering for us. Why? Because God, who came to redeem us, in order to do that, in order to lift us up, he not only became one of us, but he also endured the depths of human pain in order to reconcile humanity in all its fullness to God. Christ bore witness to all of the human experience, the good and the bad, even the bits we like to hide or pretend don't happen or are ashamed or embarrassed of. He took all of that upon himself, and in doing that, he brought healing to it. Christ couldn't just take the good. He had to take the bad as well so that it could be transformed. Because where God touches, healing and transformation does follow. That is the extent to which our God went for us. Went for us. And we are called to walk in that path too, to take up our cross and follow in the way of Christ, to follow in the way of one who saw the suffering in the world, and rather than running from it, entered into relationship with those experiencing it, going where the pain was, confronting the difficulty, meeting the people trapped in the boxes that society had made for them, and taking them out of those boxes, and raising them up. We ourselves and our call to meet people in the same way, we can only do that if we're prepared to meet people where they are and hear the truth of who they are, putting aside our own preconceptions or the words and descriptions that others use, meeting them as the person they are which is, of course, how Christ encountered and encounters people in all the fullness of their humanity and as beloved children of God. Christ meets us as we truly are, warts and all. And we are to do the same as we follow him in his way of love. Amen. This time we have our second hymn, which is Let All the World in Every Corner Sing.
God of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ, you promise to hear us when we pray to you in faith with thanksgiving. We pray for one another, for our families and friends through whom we learn to love and to be loved. We pray particularly at this time for those family uh, and friends who are separated from us because they are in other countries uh, or other alert levels. Thank you for all who care for us. Give us grace to serve Christ by serving our neighbors and our community, loving others as he loves us. We thank you for the unfailing love you hold out to everyone in Jesus Christ. Comfort and heal those in sorrow, need, sickness, or any other trouble. A moment of silence, we call to mind all those we know and need at this time. Those who have asked for our prayers and those with no one to pray for them. Give them courage and hope in their distress and bless those who minister to them. We remember with gratitude your many gifts to us in creation and the rich heritage of these islands. Help us and people everywhere to share with justice and peace the resources of the earth. Give wisdom to those in authority among us and to all leaders of the nations. We pray particularly for the decisions that are being made by our government and by health officials at this time. We pray for those particularly in the hospitals in Auckland as they care for those affected by uh, Delta COVID-19. And we pray too for the vaccination rollout throughout our country and through the Anglican Missions Board's uh, Get One, Give One campaign for the rollout uh, throughout the Pacific and uh, particularly throughout third world countries overseas. We pray for your church throughout the world, thanking you for all who serve Christ and his kingdom. By your spirit, strengthen your people for their work and witness in the world. Unite us in your truth and love, that we who confess your name may also reflect your glory. We pray particularly for the church uh, throughout the Christchurch Diocese this week, as all of our parishes uh, work through diocesan plans to reopen churches for public worship. We look forward to being together once more to celebrate our common faith together. We pray for those too who are in vulnerable situations or vulnerable health, who are not able to regather with us at COVID level two. We ask you to be with them and to guide us in our support of them. We remember with thanksgiving all who have died in Christ, and we rejoice at the faithful witness of your saints in every age, praying that we may enter with them into the unending joy of your heavenly kingdom. We pray and give thanks for the lives of all those we know 
who have died recently. Amongst them, we pray for Michael Wilkinson of this parish. We ask your comfort too on those who mourn. Moment of silence, we make our own prayers to God. Merciful God, you look with compassion on all who turn to you. Hear the prayers of your people. Grant that what we have asked in faith we may, by your grace, receive through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God of mercy, you have given us grace to pray with one heart and one voice and have promised to hear the prayers of two or three who agree in your name. Fulfill now, we pray, the prayers and longings of your people, as may be best for us and for your kingdom. Grant us in this world to know your truth, and in the world to come to see your glory. Amen. And as Christ teaches us, we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. God, our creator, yours is the morning and yours is the evening. Let Christ, the son of righteousness, shine forever in our hearts and draw us to that light where you live in radiant glory. We ask this for the sake of Jesus Christ, our redeemer. Amen. In the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and forever. Amen. Just a moment, uh, we'll have our final hymn, uh, which is, O oh Jesus, I Have Promised, uh, following which, um, at the conclusion of our service, you're all very welcome to unmute yourselves and stay on to catch up. Uh, just a couple of notices before that, um, as has been mentioned. Uh, we're currently working through a plan for the reopening of St. Mary's for um, Sunday morning services. Uh, that plan um, will be going to the diocese for approval and uh, specific details should be available around about Wednesday or Thursday. So look out for... Um, some communication around that time uh, or do contact the office. Um, the services in the first couple of weeks, if we're still at level two, which we likely will be, um, will look uh, different to what we're used to. Um, and there'll be some information around that just as we transition back to in-person services with the added um, Delta restrictions. Uh, just to be aware, but we will be able to gather. The, we will be continuing um, in some form online services as well. So if you don't feel comfortable returning to the church straight away um, and gathering together, there will be an opportunity still to come together online. Um, and there'll be details about that as well. Uh, the office is currently open again. Um, it's normal hours, nine till one, Tuesday through to Friday. Uh, so you are welcome to uh, pop in there. Uh, just be aware if you are coming in um, that uh, obviously with the new restrictions, we do ask that you are wearing a mask, um, that you must sign in either on the sheet uh, in the hall or in the atrium of the hall um, or via the COVID-19 tracer app. Um, and the QR codes are there. 
uh, and also uh, just be aware of, of spacing, particularly if there's uh, more people in the in the office. But we are reopen, and um, you are welcome to pop in. Uh, right, that is uh, those notices. Um, so now we will have our final hymn, which is "Oh Jesus, I Have Promised." And once again, um, thank you to Josh and Catherine for recording these for us for today's service. So we will just move to that now. <laughs> 